My name is Mary Ellen Gonsi, and I'm program director, program chair of the Historical Society of New And I'm very happy to present Mark Busa. And he's going to be talking on the geology of Europe. And as some of you have already seen his rocks, I'm sure you can find them in your backyards too. So after tonight, you probably want to go looking at them. Um, if you have questions, please ask your questions. And we're not so formal that we have to, you know, raise your hand or whatever. But um, the, and I have to add that the Historical Society is still trying to replace the roof. So anything that you can help us with, we're selling t-shirts, ornaments, mugs, and we're having programs every month. The next program is April 20th. And it's the first light battery, which was a Civil War unit that originated in New Haven. And 32 of Hebron's residents were part of that unit. So the, that program should be pretty exciting. Um, we have a list of all of our programs for the rest of the year on the table in the black in the back. Please help yourselves to them. Okay? Thank you for coming. One, Mark, one more thing. Okay. Another thing for the capital campaign oh, is the, the, the milk power, the water powered mill site um, book just came out in December and we're selling them. It ties in kind of nicely with Mark's presentation tonight. Where's that? The, the books are right over there on that table. So if anyone's interested, I've got a pocket here that would like your money. <laughs> Thank you. Do you think, uh, uh, Marianne, do you think if uh, some of the foreground lights were dimmed, yeah. we might we see We can get it. those back out again. We might be able to see the screen. Because a lot of the pictures you're going to see, by the way, I'm not a photographer, but I've taken most of them. And a couple of them I'm actually proud of. So. <laughs> Are you going to tell us which ones? That one right there. That's one of my that's one of my. Most, almost all of them are. And my wife were taking them. They'd be beautiful. That's the truth. She's got a family there. I know her. But uh, thank you for having me, Historical Society. It's, it's very rare. Two things. It's very rare for someone like me to get up and talk about rocks. Uh, because, you know, Many, many may ask, well, what good are our rocks? Some of us know that they're good. And that's what I hope to convey to you tonight. But secondly, uh, is, uh, it's a Thursday night and you're here, and you're here to talk, you're here to listen to someone talk about rocks. So I, <laughs> you're good. So I got a lot of pressure on me tonight. So bear with me. So that was a, 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 um, a, a name for the title for the talk. Uh, it's very hard to come up with a good title, but uh, be, beware of uh, geology in our town. Uh, to talk about the geology in our town would be impossible by, by one person on one night, by someone living their whole life, because geology encompasses so many things. So really, my talk is really going to focus more about the rocks of our, uh, I'm going to move around a lot so you can uh, the rocks which is my favorite thing. And the Hebron Nice, you may have heard of the town of Hebron and all these other uh, uh, references to Hebron, but the, a Nice is a kind of rock. So Hebron has its own kind of rock. And this isn't just in our town. It spans all the way down to Gillette Castle and all the way north up into Massachusetts. So it's kind of exciting to have a, a very large, a, a rock that covers a large expanse of space named for a town. Uh, a little bit about the history, because this is a historical society. I tried to fold in as much as I could about how history is connected with geology. And, that, and that's hard to do uh, over a short period of time, but that was one of my focus points in this talk. And, uh, and then lastly, our landscape. So essentially, the ground we walk on. Many of us can walk all our lives, however long we live here, and never really see much of the rock that exists under the soil, under the vegetation. We may see boulders and loose rock dotted amongst the farm fields and the woodlands, but 
But that's not rock that's connected to the Earth's surface. It's a little bit different. So uh, most of what we see every day when we hike and walk around is the stuff on the surface. That tells an interesting story as well. I'm more versed about rocks and less versed about this stuff. And I have way more slides tonight than I could possibly cover. So you will find that as I get to certain points in the presentation, I skip over a bunch of slides, many of them being maps. And uh, I'll do that. And but if if you have a specific interest in a, a, a location that you live or you know about, uh, we can always go back later if you want after and I'll look at a map in more detail or something more detailed. But in the essence of making it interesting, not too boring. It's getting late. It's a Thursday night. I don't know where you're going. <laughs> so what I thought I'd start off with, uh, and it's the hardest way to do it, but you're all as fresh as you're going to be right now, is <laughs> just giving you enough enough information about rocks so that we can, when we talk further in, and see pictures as we go further in, you begin to see uh, you get to understand a little bit more about what the rock means. And, and the study of rocks uh, is very vast, like any study today in our world. Uh, we're talking about metamorphic rocks. Our town is underlain, not just our town, but all the way to Portland and all the way up to Providence. All these rocks are old metamorphic rocks, most of them. There's so much stuff. And the interesting thing I think you should think about is that when we go out and collect one of these metamorphic rocks at the surface, and we look at the minerals that are made of, those minerals they're made of grew at high, high temperatures and high, high pressures. And now they're at the surface. How did they get there? If the rocks at the surface grew at 500 degrees Celsius and about four miles deep, now they're at the surface. So that's an exciting thing to think about. We're looking at rocks that were once down really deep in the core of an old mountain chain, and now they're at the surface. Is that exciting? We live in, a, in an area where uh, there were Alpine or Himalayan mountains 400 million years ago. And since then, the ground has lifted up, and erosion has eroded them off, kind of like taking an ice cube in a glass of water. And if one night floats above it, right? and eight ninths flows below the wall. If you keep shade in the ice cube, it keeps adjusting and lifting up. And that's what happens with mountains. As you shave them off by erosion, the mountains lift up a little more and you start to expose the corals, the deep parts. So these are the kind of rocks that are at our surface now in Hebrew, in Hebrew and in, in the Eastern Connecticut. And that's really what all this verbiage is talking about. Could you define metamorphic? Metamorphic means change of form. And uh, so the rocks were once maybe a shale or a sandstone or a lava rock, but now they've been buried so deep that those minerals can't stay that way. They transform into a new rock. And they do it without melting. It's all done in the solid state. That's another interesting thing. I don't want to spend too much time, but I have to give you this context because now when I show you pictures of the rocks and you come up here and you look at the rocks, you've got to say, Hey, well, they have crystals in them, they're shiny, they're pretty, they're flaky, they're uh, this and that, they're sugary looking, but they grew under very extreme conditions. We can never look at that, right? 500 degrees Celsius. With four miles of rock on top of you. Can you imagine how much pressure that is? So that's the key. Metamorphic rocks at the surface now tell us those kinds of things. And they may take on a texture to them. If they're stressed, I, I said this to uh, I say this to my class a lot. Imagine the ceiling of this, of this room starting to come down, and the floor starting to come up. And if it's like a science fiction movie, right? To get your space that you're standing is getting squeezed. We are oriented in a long dimension, right? All of us have a long dimension from head to toe. What would we want to do to survive? Lay down flat, right? Orient ourselves so that 
we don't get squeezed sooner than we have to. Well, minerals do that when they start getting squeezed. <coughs> minerals will adjust their position so that if I'm squeezing, squeezing the rock this way, the minerals will align themselves this way. And you'll see what that means when we see rocks that have a texture to them. <coughs> so, um, so they may appear flaky, striped, or banded, and if you came up here before, or if you come up here after the show, the show, talk, uh, you, you look for flaky or banded or striped men or, uh, rocks that have that appearance, and that's because they were growing under a stressed environment. Mountain building, things like that. The two major types of rock we see in Hebrew are called schist and nice, and for those people who are into etymology, I, I looked those meanings up. I studied these for 30 years. I was surprised that schist wasn't German, but it's French. And then back to Latin and Greek. I'm going to skip over this just for now. Uh, these rocks also occur nearby in the Hebrew Nice, uh, and they are a little bit different uh, in their character. To the west, we have the Glastonbury Nice. I have a sample up there of that. And to the east, as you climb up the hill to Columbia, uh, you enter into the rock underlaying the rock underlying that area is called Canterbury Nice, named after a type location in Canterbury. And these rocks uh, have a slightly different character. We can talk more about that. But in case you wonder, uh, can rocks be stressed and bent and folded? This is uh, from one of my classes. This is a quartz vein. And you can follow the curved folds. And now this rock, you know, you know what rock is? It's hard. How does it fold and bend? Well, when <laughs> rocks are deep in the crust, four to five miles deep, they behave more like silly putty than they do solid, brittle. Silence. And they can, over long periods of time, bend and contort and fold and twist. There's perfect evidence on it. And then since then, metamorphic rocks that we have in town have been uh, classified according to pretty much what are they made of? Mineral content. And what's their, what's their grain or shape? That's called the texture. And uh, I, I'll skip over some of these unless someone wants to uh, look at them later. But this just this just just uh, gives you a little more information about how rocks are identified. How the market rocks by their mineral content. And uh, again, here um, because metamorphic rocks, someone has to metamorphic a changed form. They have a they have a uh, they were a different kind of rock long ago. <coughs> and as a result of being heated up and stressed, <coughs> what they were changes to something new. So you go from a, a, from a shale, which is a, a mud rock, and if you heat it up and you squeeze it more, increase temperature and pressure, you, can, you might, might change it to a slate. And if you continue to heat it up and squeeze it more, you might change it to a phyllite and eventually to a schist or a nice. So that just tells you there's a whole history to how metamorphic rocks are. And it's really based a lot on temperature, pressure, and time. <coughs> uh, geologic time, I just put this up to remind us that uh, the Earth is very old. We live right up here, thin line, the top of this line. Uh, the rocks we're looking at in Hebron are down around here about 400 million years old. The glacial period is just a little piece up here. So there's a whole heck of a lot of time between the last ice age here in Connecticut Center and uh, the rocks under that underlay the sediments from the ice age. It's a big, big gap of time. Uh, let's skip over some of this stuff. It's interesting about that. Imagine uh, looking at a map of the Earth right now. We know we've all come to be um, knowledgeable about where the continents are, North and South America, right? You learn that in elementary school, what they look like, Asia, 
Antarctica and the South Pole, right? But back about 440 million years ago, this is a reconstruction of what they think the Earth, in terms of continents and oceans, look like. And you won't see any North America, South America, Iceland, I mean Iceland, Antarctica, because they didn't. The configurations of the continents on the Earth were vastly different. There was even oceans that we don't even hear about. That the Yakutis Ocean here, Tectonic Foreland Basin. There's oceans as well as continents, Avalon, Laurentia. These were land masses and oceans in the configuration we figure, and it's done with, uh, you know, by people who really know what they're doing. It's not just a fun game. Uh, but the crust of the Earth moves and shifts. And so, so do the ocean basins and the continents. They go along for the rock. So that the, there's times in the past where collisions occurred between continents. Separations occurred within continents to create oceans. There's pretty good evidence of that in the rock. I'm not going to get into any more of that. That's a, a, a topic called plate tectonics. It's the modern view of how the Earth is dynamic and, and the, uh, the thin, crispy crust of the Earth cracks and moves around because there's hot stuff underneath welling up and, and shifting it, causing it to move around. That's our modern view of the Earth. But what that means is the rocks, uh, a little after this period, where the top was the time when the Hebrew formation was just beginning to form, probably uh, let's believe that the sediments on the bottom of this Yakutis Ocean the mud, the limey stuff, all the dying clams and mussels and farramethera were all uh, depositing onto this ocean floor, made it a big thick deposit. And then this ocean slowly closed and slammed into Laurentia. All those ocean sediments got squeezed and buried and metamorphosed. So what were once sands and muds and silts? And limey secretions became recrystallized into the into these big blocky calcilicate gneisses of the Hebrew formation. I think I've said enough about rocks because I, I, there's so many other parts of this presentation that deal with our home our hometown that I want to get to. Um, so the Hebrew nuts, how it became named for large exposures on the rocks, on the west-facing cliffs uh, along the east side of the Connecticut River, just like from the north end of East Haddam Village in good speed, and if you track it down the river to <coughs> Gillette Castle, there's beautiful cliffs exposed there. If you've ever been there, you've seen it. That was, that was the type and locality of the mapper, the geologic mappers of the Hebron Nice, and they were able to trace it north, northeast, this large formation of gneisses into our town. So this is where the town got, I mean, the name, the, the name got its, uh, well, the nice guy came from. So oddly enough, it's not from here. It, you, the rocks we see all underlaying our town, pretty much any exposure, eagle rock, etc., uh, are here in nice. It's a large formation. I took a picture of, uh, oops. The, just south of the, uh, the swing bridge. So all these cliffs, you can't really see them. The swing bridge is there. They're made for pretty picture. That's the Hebrew nice. And here's this, these are some photographs of those rock cuts as you drive up 151, just north of the village of East Head. And because it's been the coldest March for a long time, right? There's still icicles hanging from the <laughs> rock wall. This was only taken a couple weeks ago. Uh, this is a geologic map. I think I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say too much about it, but i just put you on a map if you like maps. Here's the Connecticut River. Here's the Good Speed Bridge I just took a picture of. And uh, a geologic map <coughs> typically contains the topography you can barely see as thin lines showing the elevation of the land surface as a two-dimensional uh, piece. It has rivers, but then it overprints it with colored uh, with colored uh, regions which signify rock types. So 
So the Hebrew nice is this yellow tree right out here and here. And then the lines between these colors signify where one rock type is, in, is adjacent to a different kind of rock. It takes a lot of time, a lot of practice, a lot of uh, uh, mental struggle to learn how to read <laughs> geological maps. But they're, they're beautiful. This comes from the Connecticut State map, 1985. And I have a bunch of these other ones here of different regions around our town. But what I want to get to is just a couple of pictures of um, that I took of the local rock. This is from the uh, west side of Jerry Daniels Road in, in Marlboro. If you drive up the road going north, uh, it was a beautiful night. It was twilight, so that's, a, that's the true color. And it was a cold, cold, cold twilight. And I saw this outcropping and I went up there. This is a nice outcropping. Here's another outcropping of the Hebrew nice top. You know, look at this, and you can see these what I call sub-horizontal fractures, cracks in the rock. And they kind of they kind of weather out as these hummocky kind of bumps in the rock, right? It seems to be characteristic of the Hebrew nice. You see it here too, don't you? Right? Well, guess what? People took advantage of this over the years. They said, hey. All those little sulfurs on the cracks, it kind of looks like a, an eagle. <laughs> That's the backside of the eagle. <laughs> and if you see that, you know, those, those, those sub-horizontal cracks or seams in the rock lend itself really nicely for like mouths or creases and skin. And I started wondering, so I started visiting some of the rock outcrops in the area of Eagle Rock. And that is a characteristic of what you might call lithologic or a field characteristic of the Hebrew nice in some places. There is it. Oh, I was a little light. I apologize for that. Uh, uh, just a quick diversion here about some of the mappers of Connecticut bedrock geology. This is a little bit about the history. It goes back to the 1830s and 40s. By James Gates Percival, he was at Yale, he was a student at Yale. Uh, he's probably most known, if you type him up, he's a poet, he was a great poet in his day. He was also, I think, a, a physician, possibly, but he was a great geologist. And he was the first geologist to survey the, the state of Connecticut. And the story goes, he, from what I read, the state was divided up into four mile transcripts, transects, east and west, north and south. And he was on horseback. And he went four miles to the end of the state of Connecticut. I mean, went up from the sound to the north end of the state. Moved over four miles, came down. Moved over four miles. Imagine that. And then he was contracted years later. He split those four miles into two mile transects. How laborious that was. He almost had more time. And it was said that he, uh, he was noted, noted to visit almost every town in Connecticut by Blanton, I would too. But uh, his map is elegant, his descriptions of all the rock formations is elegant, but still much of it very accurate today as it was back then. So it was a really neat undertaking by a very brilliant man, obviously. And uh, what else was I going to say? Uh, I'll show you a couple of pictures. He also did this at a time when another a geologist, Shepard, and I often wondered that uh, road down, and just before you get to the center of Marlboro, there's a little road called Shepard Road. It's about the same way. And along that road, between Shepard Road and Johnson Road, there was an, an ancient, not ancient, no, no, ancient there's the ruins of an old quarry where they were quarrying the, uh, the diabase. I wonder if he found it and they named the road. I don't know. There's something historical to it. I love it. And these are, I know these are hard to see. These are the geologic maps that, uh, this geologic map that Percival created. Like I said, still a lot of the detailed descriptions are unmatched by anyone. It's a book, it's hard to find. <laughs> It's published by a very dis very obscure publisher out of New Haven years ago, and if you find a good copy, it's worth a lot of money. <laughs> I 
And then later on, in the beginning of the 20th century, more geology was mapped in Connecticut. They even looked at the economic resources by Rice and Gregory and Ben Robinson. Uh, and then I bring you to the next segment of the talk. Now that I've given you a little bit about, uh, about rocks, the Hebrew nice, and a little bit about people that mapped it, put together our current, I am about to the current view, but um, people still continue to map the state in more detail the geology. I think that this is something that everyone can, most everyone can appreciate. I drive on 66 nearly every day. It's roughly an east-west road, right? And everybody who's driven on it from here to Columbia, to Portland, they'll be up and down, up and down. Some of these hills are pretty big. And you continue to go up and down, up and down. And uh, that's because of the landscape. And that's also because of the rock that underlies it. And I, this is, I know this is a lot of verbiage, but it's likely, our landscape we see now is likely what it's looked like for many thousands of years. It probably hasn't changed. The last ice age was about 20,000 years ago. They call it the glacial period. Uh, we are now in an interglacial period. We're in a warm period. The glacial period was 20,000 years ago. It was cold and then gradually warmed where we are now. And maybe where we'll be for another five, 6,000 years, and I'm sure. It will, will eventually go back into an ice age if things kind of continue on the way. The thing about ice age is the ice is they deposit a lot of junk on top of the rock. And they also rip up and scour the rock, too. We're talking about a mile, a mile thick of ice over us. 20,000 years ago. Four or 5,000 feet of ice. So you can just imagine what the ground surface was, was uh, grinding and scraping by this ice sheet, and then as it melted, as the earth warmed, and it melted, whatever was in that ice fell up and mantled the surface of the rock. So what do, what do I mean by Route 66 and this? Is, what I mean is, uh, with all this work that glaciers can do, depositing and scouring rock, it is the structure of the bedrock that strongly impacts the shape of the landscape. To look at the structure of the rock, it mimics this landscape we see today. <coughs> it forms the valleys. Why are the valleys here in Hebron and as you go to Portland or east of us? They're, they trend to the south, north and south, the valleys do, the ledges do. The rivers pretty much flow north and south. Because the bedrock has cracks and structures in it that go north to south. Yeah, the glaciers did pile stuff on it and deposit stuff on it, but the bedrock really dictated the structure. All that follows in that. I talk about political boundaries here in geology. I'm sure our pol political boundaries, the town boundaries of Hebron and other towns, has changed in the past. Matter of fact, I think reading a little bit about the history, it was likely long ago in the 1700s that the Black Ridge River was the western boundary of Hebron for a while. So geological features, major rivers like the Black Ridge, dictate political boundaries. Makes sense, right? Hey, you're not coming over to our town because you've got to cross that river. You know, that makes sense, right? Or legends for that matter. Uh, there's other, other interesting things like Aston Lake, why the town of Lebanon's line goes right through the lake. I'm not sure about that. But there are connections. Sure. So uh, just geological boundaries can often become political boundaries. So what I'm going to show you now are some, some of the rivers and valleys that I've, I've visited over the last few weeks. Uh, took photographs, photographs, fell in love with our, our town all over in terms of the natural beauty. Uh, we really live in a beautiful place. And a couple other places I visited over the weeks were landmarks. Uh, think about high ground. If you were back in those days, knowing where the high ground was, outlooks, to see out if there were encroaching communities coming into your town and you didn't, or, or, or any kind of threats like that. If you knew where the high ground was, that was important, right? <coughs> and it still is, I mean, to some degrees. And it's 
mostly due to the structure of the rocks under the surface. It could be due to massive boulders dropped by melting ice, which I'm going to show you. So, and knowing the, the directions of the rivers and the valleys, the course of the rivers and the valleys. Again, if you were back in those days, if you want to know where the high ground was, if there was a flood, or there was threats, you've got to get to the high ground. And Prophet's Rock was kind of something like that, right? Families would become separated, we're united at this location. We decided to settle in our area. It's a high ground. I just went up there yesterday. Heart was pumping like I haven't had a pump in a long time. It was good. It was a good thing. Dogs were barking at me. And I took some pictures of Prophet Rock. And uh, I, I, I got on to the top of this one. I didn't try this one. It was a little too dangerous. This side of it. I couldn't get up that back side. I got on to here and I took some photographs. Just to show, that's a meter stick in the foreground. The stripes on it. You know, some of the vistas looking south, southeast. You can see a, a valley and then a ridge. Looking south, you see that ridge kind of comes down. When you're looking south, everything kind of drains to the south. So the valley's turning south. I thought that was as good as I could get it. And this is the time of year to do when there's no leaves on the trees. So as we look south, we see drainage to the south. This is looking north. So Prophet's Rock is a pegmatite, actually. It's a type of granite. And uh, that's a penny uh, for scale. And uh, it's hard to make out in this photograph because there's big feldspar crystals in there, this big. So, <clears throat> penny, that's something like that. All those gold scars are that big. This is a pegmatite. A lot of the prominent rock exposures in the town, as well as anywhere in eastern Connecticut, pegmatites are often responsible for forming ledges and outcroppings because they're, they're bulky and resistant to erosion. So, they tend to hang on and, and stick out because they don't grow away. Are they bedrock or are they? Please? They are. Uh, this one here is a uh, good question. Now, that's probably glacial, glacial right there. That's not connected yeah, to the rock surface below. Good point. Yeah, that's loose and it's cracked and split somewhat. That was probably joined. There's other, there's an even more famous and a dramatic looking one called Lido Rock in Higgin. We've ever been on 154, heading south from Middletown, heading toward the village of Higgin. Into the uh, western side of 154, you can see a split rock that is much more plainer, plainer in shape. It looks just like a book that's been split and opened up. And people have called it Bible Rock. It's called Bible Rock. And it's about the same scale as that. It's huge. And those are glacially dropped. These are big boulders out in the middle of nowhere. Now here are some of the rivers in our area. I'm sure you're familiar with them if you've been out and around. Black Ledge, like I said, is in Blunt, as far as I can see in the history. I don't know what that means. The light, likely the Native Americans lived here before we uh, settled. All of that was later named by the Gay family. Bay City. And these are a bunch of maps. I'm not going to go into this. Um, I just want to say the Black Lodge starts up here in Peter Pond up in Bolton. I took a visit up there one <coughs> fall afternoon and uh, took some pictures, but I didn't get the end of the selection. So if you want. This is Bay City. And the reason why I took this picture is because uh, we all we've been hiking, you've noticed in New England, uh, snow walls through thick forests are pretty common. Right? They go right through the forest. And some of those trees can be this big around, you know, hundred year old trees, yet there's stone walls going right through. So, the reason why I brought this up was because back in Percival's days, in 1830, when we mapped the state, about 98% of Connecticut was farmland, about 2% was forest. And it's pretty much got a full 180 degree total. Now we're about 2% farmland, 98% forest. So to Percival, he was able to go out on his horseback and see mostly fields and rock structures. It's not that easy. And stone walls through middle of forest signify that this was once pasture for farmland. 
And now, you know, 100, 150 years later, you have a full forest group. It's pretty cool to think about. And then I came upon a chimney. Now, you're never going to see this, I don't think, in this slide because of the lighting, but I said, look, the black rocks in this chimney in Gay City, probably a, a chimney from uh, people who've been out there probably know more about it than I do. But, uh, there's lots of black rocks, just like this black rock I, I plucked. I didn't, I didn't take anything from the artifacts, but nearby, a black rock. It's lightly put into the chimney, and this is a black rock that Black Ledge was named after. They're, they're called amphibolites. It's a kind of metamorphic rock. It's if you take a a lava rock and you bury it deep in it and it recrystallizes, it will recrystallize the lava into an amphibole mineral in form of black, black rock. So the gays, the gays are named the Owansett River, Black Ledge River, because of the Black Ledges. I love to bring that in. And, and there's an old cemetery there. If you haven't been there yet, you can visit it. And there's one of the gay family uh, members. And I took a picture of a little stone wall that surrounds the uh, cemetery. You can see big black rocks in there. So, a little bit of history in geology, right? I did skip over some of these maps. I put these here in case anybody was interested in them. We can look at them together. So about the rivers and down east and ledges along the western side of the I'm going to show you some pictures of West Branch, Fawn Brook, and the Fawn Brook area in Black Ledge. Along the central and eastern side of the Hebron, Hope Valley Brook and Raymond Brook into Jeremy River. These are the major rivers. Eventually, these flow into the Salmon River, which then goes into the Connecticut River. So the flow is kind of south with a southwestern component. And it gets into the Black Ledge. Black Ledge flows down into the Salmon. Salmon flows south southwest into the Connecticut River. That's kind of our drainage. To the north of us, Gilead, Andover, they got highlands, and a lot of the rivers up there, our lakes up there, are sources of these rivers that flow south southwest. Again, general trend of the bedrock. Here's some pictures of the upper reaches of Long Brook. I went up here on a cold, snowy morning. It was crystal. There. Never been out here. This is um, the site of Slocum Road, Slocum Road near West Street, not West Street, uh, Park Road, Slocum, and it dead ends. And if you walk down that dead end, you know, it's going to get a land, a tree land, and uh, beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I'll show you. This is this is Gilead right here. 1985, and we're talking about the Fallen Brook. We're up around this area. Kind of the headwaters of the Fallen Brook. And beautiful, look at beautiful uh, sloping land surface down to the Fallen Brook. And out here in the distance, you can see the other side of the valley. Very pretty. I, I, felt, I felt back in love with this art town during this uh, excursion. It's a couple of these excursions. I had some people walking their dogs. And I said, I've never been here. I've lived here 25 years. I've never been out to this area. I don't have a geologist. I should stop this. <laughs> Shame on me. Ledges exposed at the Hebrew Nice in this area. This is the west side of Buck Road. Guess what that looks like? Remember those sub horizontal mm -hmm. cracks? Can you picture an eye here, a mouth here, and a nostril here? Someone could go and paint another picture. <laughs> That's the Hebrew Nice. That's the West Branch, West Branch of Long Road. I'm looking north for 66, one of my favorite spots. I never, I never walked out to it because of, uh, it's kind of a busy area. Here. Very pretty. And then uh, the West Branch of Long Road. I mean, Fawn Brook Valley, on Paper Mill. Now, this is Paper Mill. If you go up on 66, past Eagle Rock, looking that way, there's a Paper Mill Road, and you know it's a dead end. Nice. How about dead end? So then I was on Holy Road, where we're off the Jones Road, took a ride on the Paper Mill. I think at that point it might be Marble Road. 
where we drove down Paper Mill, the most beautiful valley. Some of these pictures here. And that, that ends up. Paper Mill was probably connected at one point in time, and it's not, not anymore. But it, if you ever get a chance just to take a ride, beautiful, absolutely beautiful. See so that? Look at the ridges of the valleys in the distance. You think you're somewhere up in New Hampshire or not? And then a little, I, I, got, I kind of start to wind things down talking about uh, things at the surface, things that we'll encounter if you go out for a walk in the woods or on the linear trail. Right, we all, we all know this. Grayville Falls is a popular spot for people to go to. And this is my, my favorite photo because here is the Heber Nice with its grain or structure to the rock as shown in place connected to the earth. And yet someone built a little wall, some human built a little wall over the top of it, kind of mimicking the st natural structure of the rock. I said, that's a perfect geologic <coughs> human. Are those two, the bottom rock is the least? Nice, yeah. Nice. Right. Yeah. Are the top rocks nice also? Uh, they may be, they may be boulders of nice or pegmatite. I didn't, uh, Look at each individual one, but it's likely the, the rock in the area. A little bit rounded, as you can see, probably tumbled around in the stream valley over years. But people picked it up and they said, ah, I don't know, but for some reason, maybe they had to raise the height of that little ledge a little bit more. For some reason, maybe. Is that code for scale? That glove is for scale. Yeah. 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 Too many uh, in Hebrew per se, at least in 
far as I know, at least anybody who knows anything let me know about that. Uh, we haven't been a place where we quarried a lot for sand and gravel or, or uh, minerals, uh, building materials. But if you go north to Bolton, if you go west to Glastonbury, if you go east to Willimantic and Wyndham, go south to Colchester, then they do. So we may have just been in a, a, a the Hebrew nice in this very may have just not been fruitful in terms of uh, minerals, and resources, and such. <coughs> now, one of the places at the surface we see it are um, our, our deposits left by glaciers. Now, the last map, ice age, I said, was about a mile thick, 20, 15, 20,000 years ago. So as the, as the landscape eroded and the ice deposited, <coughs> it laid things down on top of the surface as it melted and receded. Our Earth, about 20,000 years ago, you can see the ice cap to the north stretched all the way down to Connecticut and Cape Cod and such, out into the sound. It was much bigger. It was colder. The poles were bigger. They were thicker and more widespread. As the ice warmed up, as time warmed up and the ice melted, it left behind a large lake in Connecticut called Lake, Glacial Lake Hitchcock, and it stretched up the mass into Vermont, and there's evidence of the deposits of this lake all over uh, Enfield, Wellington, Summers, Windsor, Lox, Windsor. Uh, drill drillers have identified thick, thick deposits of clay and silt laying down by lake, by lake deposits. So there's evidence of this large lake. And it stayed there for I don't know how long before the, the natural dam around Rocky Hill was breached. And then there was a large drainage of the lake. It may have been in part responsible for changing the, the course of the Connecticut River from Owen Lake into New Haven, and then instead cutting through Middletown and going down through uh, into the Sound in the We'll see why you decided to go that way, where the rocks are higher in elevation, more resistant to erosion, must have been a big reason, and that might have been associated with a large break in this lake that is a lot of water, right? Imagine that draining up. So, large deposits of material. Here's an actual picture of a modern polar continental glacier and how thick they can be. And at the bottom, you can see this is where, I don't know if you can see it, there's these sinuous shapes. Those are rivers and channels of meltwater. As the melt water is melting here, it's rushing out of the glacier, at the base of the glacier, moving sediment, sand, gravel. <coughs> and so I said, well, my youngest boy took a photograph for me. We are at West North Westchester here. I said, hey, the snow is still melting. We've got to get a picture. It's all dirty. It's full of dirt. It's full of sand and gravel, right? What's going to happen when the snow melts? <coughs> Drops, right? You've got a big pile of junk. The same thing with glaciers. When they melt, you get a big pile of junk. All sorts of sizes, all sorts of shapes. And at the bottom of the glacier, there's often a meltwater stream flowing through the bottom. Uh, here is over at Hebron Elementary School parking lot, big pile of snow. But under here is a catch basin. So the water's kind of melting and draining the catch basin and hollowing out the spots. And it's not unlikely that these kinds of features happen at late in glaciers at a much larger scale. And that's a lot of how glaciology to study people go up to real glaciers. Present day, when they look at the features that are happening, then they come back to the Features like here in Connecticut, where the glaciers were here 20,000 years ago, they say, Oh, hey, that deposit looks like the one we saw up in Alaska. Remember? The meltwater stream was dragging channels of sand and gravel out. And that's what we got over here in the Fenton River in Mansfield. And they start making connections that way. A lot of geology is built that way. We observe present processes, we observe today. Now we go back to ancient rock and say, Hey, the same kind of product and structures we see in the rock could have been produced by the things we see today. It's a very important theory in geology. So, you can see, here's a valley of melting ice. 
Time, 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 time goes by, the ice melts away, and you're left with the deposits and the scholars left behind. And you might, eat, you might have known some of these terms like kings and kettles, rains and eskers. Is that how Holbrook called his poems? I don't know the history of Holbrook, actually. I don't, I don't think so, but I, I, can't, I can't be sure. Uh, Long Island Sound, and then Long Island comes up, right? There's no rock under that. That's a moraine. That's a kind of like if you took a bulldozer, you would plow from Connecticut shoreline up to the sound, and you left all the junk <laughs> to make to make Long Island. That's kind of what the glaciers do. But ahead of the ahead of the front of the glacial ice sheet, there was a lot of this rock and debris mounded up, kind of like a bulldozer. And then when the ice melts, they're left with this terminal moraine, they call it. And there's a, there's a picture of a moraine there. So, yeah, uh, Long Island is that way. And the interesting thing is, is in 20,000 years ago, when it was colder, right? More of the Earth's water, and I'm including the ocean water, not the, the freshwater fraction of the ocean water, was tied up in ice. So what do you think happened to the sea level? Tie more of the ocean world's water up in ice, sea level drops. You could probably walk from Old Saber up to Long Island with no water. It's, it's a sea level, it's all about 300 feet or so. And then, when the earth warmed to where we are now, all that ice melted, and not just here, uh, went into raising the sea levels, and we, we drowned the sound with water, and, and we drowned our coastlines, the Connecticut River, the Thames River, the Housatonic, the water encroached upstream into those mouths. That's why they're estuaries, that salt water and freshwater mix. So you really think that the coastline of Connecticut today is a drowned coastline of long ago, because sea level rose. <laughs> Some of the deposits left by glaciers can be called till. They almost rock hard as a rock, but it's not a rock. It's still sediment. The glacial erratic, erratics are very large boulders of rock, not connected to the ground, to the surface. Being in places they should have no reason being. This is the top of John Tom Hill in Glasgow. There, very amazing up there. That's a, that's a high way up. And I took my three older boys, and they were very young here. Adam's up there, he remembers. We went for a hike one day, and we came upon this boulder, and people typed it, and sure it would come across it. That's a big boulder. What's it doing at the top of a ridge? Too good for a boulder. This was dropped on the glacier when it melted. And there's many of these. There's a very famous one down in the southeast, near 395, 720. It's the biggest boulder. So they can be very large. And these are maps of, uh, this is a map of our area. And uh, surface geologists, sur geologists study surface materials have mapped sand and gravel deposits. Um, and most of these were probably laying down by glacier as the glacier receded. Meltwater may have been coming out of it, concentrating areas of, with sand and gravel. Uh, I'm thinking of that, uh, if you go down Mill Hill, or Mill Road from uh, Colchester to connect it to, there's a large sand area with all evergreens growing in. That's probably one of these, I think I look at it, it's one of these uh, sand and gravel deposits by the glacier. Well, they can be used for sand and gravel pits, uh, construction buildings, etc. But some sand and gravel deposits, if they're deeper down, are good aquifers. Water flows nicely through clean sand. You can pump it, come in, it will infiltrate from above and form a nice saturated sand pile. Right? So it's a good aquifer. So uh, sand and gravel deposits are good. <coughs> so now I'm going to end on the present and future state. Here's where I get a little bit philosophical and I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that too much, but uh, so far, everything we reviewed and much more. I, I'm, leaving out, I'm leaving out the living system, which makes a big, big, big 
doing great. The trees, the grass, the animals, they change and adapt and change the environment as well. And they're very important to us. But the thing is, we as human beings, as human beings living on the earth, we do modify our landscape and our geology to some degree. First, our population is growing exponentially. That's the biggest and foremost thing we have to grapple with in order to study uh, environmental problems. Really, the biggest factors that are growing as a as a human race. We need natural, fresh earth resources to live. And I emphasize fresh in parentheses because uh, good, clean water, good, fresh air, right? good, healthy food is what I think we're all starting to realize is the most important thing for health. So we use all that stuff, we need it to survive, but we also return it as waste to the earth. So we got to start thinking about it. I know we have, and people have worked hard. And, uh, don't return things to the earth that the earth doesn't want, doesn't want to do it. So um, this is my, my one and only spiel of the health of the earth. This is more repetition about uh, uh, some of the use of our land. I put, I put mills here along the rivers. He built mills here and he it was close access to running water to the, to the people long ago. It was protection along the river valleys, it was protection from weather and habitation, things like that. Sand and gravel was used for aquifers, fresh drinking water. Farms, I've thought about this in our town. Most of our farms are high up on the hills, right? Gilead Hill, Columbia. I think most of the farms. Why do you think that? I think maybe access to sunlight here in the valley, the sun's not out as long. I don't know. I don't know why, but it's, maybe the, the soil was better. I don't know. Less rocks, maybe. Less rocks. Well, that's true. The highlands tend to not have many legends, oddly enough. But uh, by the number of stone walls you see, they must have been grinding themselves to <laughs> high hell you know, when they were grinding the soil and picking up these boulders. <laughs> they call them New England potatoes, right? But some of these stone walls have massive boulders, so that must have been the thing. And then now we also see land use for transportation. From the very beginning, foot, horse, wagon, rail, and eventually uh, road. And we see all that. And all those kinds of things expose rock. Some degree. Telephone cables, uh, I mean, telecables, uh, cellular phone towers now. Wires have to high power lines have to cut through the landscape, cut through the rock. Uh, and, uh, when I work in Middletown, uh, in the area of Middletown, they've done a recent clearing of the underbrush under the high power lines. And that's a big job. And you see how much work and energy it has to be taken up to do that. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty impressive. And we also have linear trails in town, right? And you have that on Use of abandoned rail line. And this is probably generally true that the rail, when they built the rail lines back then, long ago for the trains, they probably tried to follow the flattest path, right? Hey, if I don't have to crack up rock or fill in holes, I could just carry my rail kind of smoothly along. But sooner or later, you do have to break through ledges and go over valleys and rivers, so you expose more rock. There's some the bridges over Jeremy River. If you go on the, uh, the airline trail south of Grayville, it's a beautiful, beautiful ravine there, exposing rock in the river. Uh, and even more so, up in Marlboro, uh, the line and the Flatbook viaducts uh, that go over the Black Ledge River before they dump into the Salmon. They used to be bridges, steep, steep <coughs> ravines underneath them, and then, the, from what I'm told, the, the ravine itself was filled in, so when you walk over it, it's all land. It's kind of strange. It you can envision that, that was once a ravine, a bridge, probably pretty striking. On the border of Lebanon, Route 207, south, southwest of Northwest Chester, uh, we cross Raymond Brook in the swamp. So in our town, the linear trail cuts over there from 207 across 
big swamp near the old lumber, lumber yard across the Great Hill area, and then eventually down to Jeremy River. You cross 149 in Northwest Chester, and you get into the Black Ledge of the Center. Not too much quarrying. North of town, in Bolton and Burning, there's building stone, and I have some of it up here. Um, west of us, in Glastonbury, they quarry quartz and pegmatite. Some of the apple orchards and Scots orchards, if you go out there to the north end of Scotch orchard, <coughs> uh, you can see the quarry is all rocky. Or flagstone, building stone. And then south of us, like I said, there's some sand and gravel pits in Colchester. Our future, managing our resources. As we go, as we go forward, here's my attending note here. Um, I had to put accelerated warming of the earth because we hear about that all the time. Yeah, the earth is warming uh, at, at faster than it we, we predicted would naturally warm. And that's something for us to be concerned about. But regardless of the political hype you hear, and all the politicians use it to their advantage, however they wish, but regardless of that, to me it just makes good sense to do to, to treat the earth as good school. But why is that problem? Why is that anything? Um, I don't know. That's my that's my only bit of political hype I'll give you. Uh, so the more we learn about the natural setting of our town, the better we preserve aesthetics. It's natural. Planning the land use, the resources we have. Probably one of our biggest resources, I think, in this town is good fresh water, at least right now. I worry about that because, like I said, some of the major rivers that pass from north to south through our town have their headwaters in lakes just in our town or, or north of our town. So um, we got to protect that because that's, that's good fresh water. What others have done well and have learned from in the past. There's a lot of people that have been here a long time. A lot of families have been here a long time, so uh, I'm sure they've learned a lot about the landscape, what's worked, what hasn't, what was a mess and such. So be good stewards of the earth. And I welcome you to uh, come up after now if you want to look at these rocks again, now that you have, if I've whetted your appetite anymore you're interested in anymore. <coughs> and thank you for having me.